Good evening, church family. I'm glad to be able to be back in the Word with you again tonight. I want to apologize up front. You are going to notice that there are not any uh, text boxes in this message tonight. Um, it's actually Sunday afternoon right now. It's almost 4 o'clock, and I'm back at the church re-preaching this message. I was uh, home with Marissa, and I just, I just felt like I had to come back and, and take another stab at this. So I don't have time to edit this. I don't have time to put in any bulletin points. I apologize if you're a note taker, but my heart was just full of this parable. And I felt very passionately that I wanted to come back and try and reframe uh, the way I taught it and, and just to gather my thoughts a little bit and come back and um, preach it to you again. So having said that, we're going to be in chapter 15 of Luke's gospel tonight. And I'm, I'm really excited as we enter into this chapter uh, because we're going to be exploring some of the most profound things that Jesus ever taught. This chapter in Luke's gospel is in some senses the pinnacle of his parables. We have in this one chapter the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and what we refer to as the parable of the prodigal son. And it's, it's tempting to want to take these three parables and split them up and treat them like three distinct messages that are just in the same chapter. But my heart in presenting this to you is to teach this as one big lesson. So what we're going to see is that the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the prodigal son are really three parts of one lesson or three panels of one picture, as one commentator put it. And so for tonight, we're only going to be able to spend time on the first section, and we're just going to see the context, and then we're going to look at the lost sheep, the first image in the chapter. So to begin, let's read verses 1 and 2 in Luke 15. Luke writes, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So the setting here is a large group of sinners drawing near to Jesus. It says all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him. And just as a quick side note, when scripture uses the word all, it, it doesn't always mean every single person in all of the world. For example, Luke doesn't mean that every tax collector and every sinner on the whole planet drew near to Jesus at this time. What Luke does mean is that there was a large group of sinners, and there was a large number of tax collectors, and there were some of every kind in that area who drew near to the Lord Jesus. We have to ask ourselves the question, why were these people drawn to Jesus? It's a bit odd if you just take a moment and think about it. These were people who were known by society for their sinful lifestyles. And Jesus preached openly in ways that condemned their sins. Jesus was not a cotton candy preacher. He didn't go around just making people feel good about the way they were living. So how is it that these sinners and these outcasts are drawn to hear the preaching and teaching of Jesus. How do we explain their inclination to come closer to him? I think the answer is found in the way that Jesus Christ gave them hope. His preaching simultaneously condemned their sins and gave them hope as he preached that God was willing to forgive them and receive them. So his message was the whole truth. The reality of their sin, the reality of their condemnation, and at the same time, a way to escape that wrath and judgment from God. This group of sinners was not like the Pharisees and scribes. There's a contrast in these first two verses here. The Pharisees and scribes were, for the most part, self-righteous people who were complacent with their lives. They didn't draw near to Jesus as a group because they didn't think they had any need for him. And that is one of the most deadly positions a human can be in. Self-confidence and self-righteousness that causes a person to feel no need for the gospel, no need for the Lord Jesus. 
These Pharisees didn't want to hear any preaching that demanded humility or repentance. And so they despised Christ and his message. But this crowd of sinners, they were aware of their need. They knew they were ungodly and unrighteous. They knew what it was like to live a hopeless, godless lifestyle. And so it seems like they were in a better condition to receive the message of the Messiah when Jesus preached. Notice in verse 2, their accusation is that Jesus ate with sinners. So as this large group draws near to him, Jesus receives them and he ate with them. They were welcomed into his presence and they were received by him. There's a word of encouragement here. If you're struggling with sin and you're carrying some kind of guilt, perhaps you feel unworthy or incapable of associating with Christ. You you hear Jesus preached in the scriptures what a perfect and pure and holy being he is. And you might feel like you are not able to be near him or to have some relationship with him. Well, I want to encourage you, Jesus is the friend of sinners. We see that in these first two verses here. He sits down at the table and welcomes the vile and the evil and the wicked and the ungodly. He was known in his day as the friend of sinners. And the good news is, as I preach this message tonight, he still is the friend of sinners today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's this fact that upsets the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus' status as the friend of sinners is the cause of their complaining. They detest that he sits down and receives those kinds of people. Instead of saying with faith and adoration that Jesus was a Messiah who would associate with the lowly, instead of saying that with gratitude, they say it out of a spirit of grumbling. What I mean is these, these are some of the sweetest words that were ever spoken. Their accusation is the best news imaginable. This man receives sinners and eats with them. That should have been spoken out of affection and thanksgiving to God. God, thank you that your son receives sinners. Praise God that the Messiah is a friend of sinners. That's good news. And yet these Pharisees find a way to make it the cause of complaining. So we get a glimpse into their hearts. They didn't say this with a good motive. They said this with a spirit of contempt. This man, they don't even want to say his name. This man receives sinners and eats with them. It's a pretty stark contrast, isn't it? The sinners are drawing near to Jesus while the self-righteous are standing over there complaining about the whole scene. And Jesus seizes the opportunity to teach them all. The rest of the chapter is his explanation of his mission. Why did he put on flesh and come to this world? Why did he sit down at the table with prostitutes and cheats and liars and frauds and tax collectors and publicans. Why did Jesus do those things? Well, there's one answer. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Amen. That's Luke 19.10. The Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus said when he sat down in the house of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus told us that was his mission. We're getting a glimpse into the heart of the Savior. This was his motivation. This was the task he came to accomplish, to seek and save that which was lost. And so the three word pictures that follow are all examples and demonstrations of the way he came to seek and save the lost. The first one is the image of the lost sheep. I'm going to read it for you. This is Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? 
And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. So Jesus uses a familiar concept to teach them a spiritual lesson. We've seen him do this before. You might remember a couple weeks ago, he talked about the way that they would rescue their animals out of ditches on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, if you do that, then why am I wrong for rescuing humans from their suffering on the Sabbath day? So he took something that they understood and approved of, and he used it to illustrate and justify his own mission and his own purpose. And here he's doing something really similar. He takes this hypothetical situation and he lays it out there for them. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost? The assumption is that they would all do that. They would go and search for their lost animals. And what Jesus is doing here is he's drawing a comparison. He's laying these two ideas side by side and he's saying, you would go look for your lost animals and you would make sure that you would find your lost sheep and bring it home. I've come to seek and save lost people, to seek and save lost souls and bring them home to God's family. So let's look at the parable. Let's consider the several parts of it. And what we're going to see is that this first image of the lost sheep, it follows a sequence. And the next two parables that we'll look at in the next few weeks are going to follow the same order. Something is lost. Then there's a great search for the thing that was lost. Then there is happiness when the missing object is found. And finally, each scene concludes with this abundance of joy and rejoicing. So let's apply that grid to this first image. In this first section, the missing object is a lost sheep. Somehow, in the word picture, somehow this sheep got separated from the rest of the flock. Jesus doesn't say exactly how the sheep got lost, but we could imagine a couple hypothetical situations. It could have been carelessly grazing and just insensibly wandered from the rest of the fold. It could have defiantly rebelled against the shepherd and just went its own way. It could have been distracted by something and just led aside by an unimportant thing. We're not told exactly how the sheep got lost, but it seems to me based on scripture and a little study about sheep, that one characteristic they share is that they are prone to wander. Sheep have an inclination to stray. And that's why it's important that they have a shepherd to oversee them. This sheep, this one sheep, has been separated from the shepherd. He's wandered from the flock. He's alone, and he's in danger. So we have this, this animal in a situation that it's helpless to help itself out of. This sheep can't protect itself. They aren't animals with razor-sharp teeth or claws. It's not going to be able to hunt for itself or fend for itself or fend off predators or, or hunters or anything else that would threaten it. It's not an overstatement to say that this sheep's life is being threatened. Out on its own in the wilderness, it's only a matter of time before it's going to perish. And sadly, it's going to perish alone. But that's when we see the work of the good shepherd the shepherd commits himself to a rescue mission. He leaves the 99 and he goes to look for the one. Now, when we read that the shepherd in the parable leaves the 99, we aren't to take that to mean that he doesn't care about them. It's not that this one sheep out in the wilderness is so important and so special and those other 99 aren't. The picture simply is 
The shepherd leaving the flock in a safe place. He knows that they're going to be okay in his absence. He's not exposing them to danger. He knows that it's just a, a brief amount of time that he's got to be out there looking for this other sheep. So he leaves the flock and he journeys out into the wilderness And I love this phrase that Jesus includes. Jesus says he goes and looks for it until he finds it. Those last few words are very important and I'd like you to hear them and let them sink into your heart. He looks until he finds. This shepherd is not going to look for a few hours or just check a few places. I'm guilty of that when I look for things in our house. I open up the door, uh, it's a quick up, down, left, right, I close the door, and then I'm like, well, I can't find it, and I move on sometimes. And my kids probably get that from me. They just quickly look in their room, and they come back and say, Dad, I can't find the thing that I'm looking for. Well, praise God, the shepherd in the parable doesn't look like I do. This shepherd has purposed in his heart that he is going to find the sheep. What I'm saying is, he's not coming home empty-handed. He will accomplish his task. It doesn't matter how far out there the sheep is. It doesn't matter how much time it takes. He will succeed in his mission. And then we see what the shepherd does when he finds the sheep. I say, when he finds it, not if he finds it. There are two things that he does. First, Jesus says that the shepherd rejoices when he finds his sheep. It's interesting that Jesus emphasized the joy of the shepherd, not the sheep. We could imagine that this animal had good reason to rejoice when it was found. It would have been a relief to see the shepherd approaching there to save him and bring him back to the flock. But Jesus doesn't emphasize the joy of the sheep He wants us to understand that the shepherd experiences joy when he finds the sheep. This lesson is about the attitude and actions of the shepherd. It's all about him. He rejoiced when he found the lost sheep. The second thing the shepherd does is he picks up the sheep And he carries it home on his shoulders. The word shoulders here is plural. It's the image of a man gently picking up this animal and wrapping it around his neck, probably two legs on this side and two legs on the other side, and carrying the animal on his own two shoulders. What a relief for this lost sheep. Amen? It was out there all alone exposed to a thousand dangers. This sheep was in a bad way, on the brink of death, a step away from perishing. And now it's safely carried on the strong shoulders of the good shepherd. This sheep was probably exhausted. The shepherd doesn't make the sheep walk back to the fold. He doesn't just drive the sheep and make the sheep uh, carry its its own burden on the way back. We can imagine this animal is probably tired and afraid and, and shaken up pretty bad. The shepherd doesn't do that. What he does is he picks it up and he carries the weight himself. He puts the weight of the animal on his shoulders so that he's going to bear the brunt of the sheep's weight. And when the shepherd gets home, we see the conclusion of the scene. There's great joy. There's abounding joy. Jesus said when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. This is quite a fuss over one sheep, isn't it? Can you imagine getting that phone call? Hey, come on over to my house tonight. We're celebrating Well, for what? What are you celebrating? I found my one lost sheep. Well, you would say, don't you have 99 others? I mean, this is just 1% of your flock. You could have just lost this sheep and not suffered any real damage to your wealth, right? 
What, what was so special or valuable about that one lost sheep? Well, the joy of the shepherd is found in the experience of recovering what was lost. It's not that he values this one sheep more than the 99. We said that a moment ago. The joy comes from restoring and recovering his lost possession. I came across an illustration from Martin Luther that I'm just going to paraphrase because I think it helps us to understand this joy that the shepherd experiences. We can imagine a mother who has five children. Four of the children are perfectly healthy, nothing's wrong, and they're fine. But one of the children is very sick, even to the point of almost dying in their sickness. Well, imagine the joy that fills that mother's heart when that one sick child who was about to die suddenly recovers. Um, the, the joy that fills that mother's heart over the one sick child who got better is greater than her joy over the health of the four children, isn't it? It's not to say that she doesn't love the four children or that she's not thankful for the four children's health, but having been so close to losing this child, having seen this child suffer greatly and almost perish and then get better is a cause for great and sudden joy. You probably wouldn't call somebody over to your house and ask them to celebrate with you because your four kids didn't get sick today, right? You wouldn't say, hey, come on over here and, and we're going to have a party tonight because none of my kids have been sick this week. We don't think like that. But if you had a sick child who did get better, if you had a child who was on the, the verge of death and they recovered, you would call your family over to celebrate and you'd have a party. The point is, there is a special joy expressed in this parable. And that joy is triggered by the recovery of the lost sheep. There are three times in this short parable that Jesus refers to joy or rejoicing. And the shepherd isn't just rejoicing alone. He calls his friends and his neighbors together. So now there's a whole crowd of people smiling and laughing and celebrating that this one sheep is home again. As we interpret the parable, I want to use verse 7 as the key to understanding uh, the whole image here. Let me read it to you again. Jesus says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Let's make some of the comparisons. And let's, uh, let's, let's unpack the image uh, and the, the meaning of Jesus' words here. In its context, we could say, the sinners that Jesus ate with were like the lost sheep. Remember the group of sinners back in verses 1 and 2 that were drawing near to Jesus? They were like the lost sheep out there on their own, helpless, defenseless, sure to perish if someone doesn't rescue them. Now, we're not talking about animals. We're not talking about a hypothetical sheep in a word picture. Now we're talking about real people, men and women with souls that will go on forever. They were like lost sheep who were going to die, not an animal dying out in the wilderness, but a person dying and perishing in hellfire forever. Jesus was the good shepherd. Jesus was explaining to them why he sat down with these lost sheep. Jesus was explaining to the Pharisees and scribes that he was on a rescue mission to snatch these people out of condemnation, to bring them to life out of death. He is the good shepherd in the, in the parable. Jesus has taken it upon himself to rescue us and bring us home to God. 
He basically said to them, you know, you go look for your animals, I go look for my people. And I'd like to highlight that, that possessive pronoun, my people. I say that because the shepherd in the parable referred to the sheep as his own. Listen to his words again. Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. It was his all along. So even when the sheep was out there alone and cold and scared and half dead, even then it still belonged to the shepherd. Now, the sheep was in danger, but it was only a matter of time before the shepherd found him and brought him back. And friends, I think that's a lot like Jesus. Before we were found, we were out in the world, weren't we? Separated from God, alone, helpless, defenseless. But even before we were saved, even before we put our trust in Christ, our names were written in God's book. Even before the world was made, God knew his people by name. It was only a matter of time before the good shepherd found us and put us on his shoulders. I also think along these same lines that Jesus is a lot like the shepherd in his success. In the parable, the shepherd found the sheep. He didn't try to find the sheep. He did it. He didn't set out for a certain amount of time resolving that when the time was expired, he would just come home and forget about it. He purposed in his heart that he was going to work until it was done. Jesus never fails to find the elect. Jesus never fails to bring his people home. Every single day, they are being called into his kingdom. So if you look around at the world right now and all the things that are going on, you can be confident that God is calling his people into the kingdom. No matter what circumstances are taking place, no matter what the headlines are in the news, the good shepherd is about his work. He is out and about in the world rescuing his lost sheep. And not one of them will be forgotten. Not one of the elect will be overlooked or left behind. He will see to it that every single lost sheep is found. And I think that also should bring to mind the work of the church. If the shepherd is out there finding the lost, then it needs to be our mission and our purpose to do the same thing. Right now, as I preach this, there are lost ones out there who need to be found. Right now, there are sheep out there, almost dead, and the shepherd has purpose that they need to come home. And that's our job, and that's our work, is to bring the gospel to them. That is why we preach. That's why we love our neighbors and pray for them. That's why we make it our aim to win them to Christ with the word of our testimony. We want to see lost sheep coming home. And it's also why I think we should take time to examine our hearts. We've talked a lot recently about justice and equality and anger and animosity and all kinds of tension in our country. Let this be a time for us to examine our hearts and see if there is anything in our life that distracts us from the mission. And let's apply that to our church as well. Let's be aware, let's be self-examining, and let's consider if there's anything that's distracting us or derailing us from our mission. If we are more concerned about winning a political debate or championing some cause that is not gospel-driven, then we won't see lost sheep getting rescued. Let me just say that again. If 
we are more concerned about winning political debates or championing causes that are not gospel driven, then lost sheep won't be found, at least not in our church. We won't see that beautiful thing take place. So God forbid that we stall out in our work. God forbid that we forget the work of the Good Shepherd and his heart toward the lost. So we round out the image here. There are two more comparisons I want to make before we close. Repentance is a key theme in this parable. The whole picture of the sheep being found is an image of repentance. Now that connection comes straight from the words of Jesus. He says to us in verse 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. In other words, the whole parable he just taught about the shepherd rescuing the sheep is an image and an illustration of what happens when one sinner repents. The one lost sheep was just like one lost soul getting saved. That means when Christ rescues a soul. He does it by granting them repentance. What does it look like when the shepherd finds a sheep? It looks like a man or woman repenting from their sins and putting their trust in Christ as the Savior and Deliverer. That means that real faith is not just believing good things about God's love for you. That's not all that faith is. Faith is also agreeing with God that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And so I can say, where there is no repentance, there is no spiritual life. Where there is no repentance, there is no lost sheep being found and brought home. This parable, the comfort and the hope and the strength of this parable comes from those who repent and turn to Christ. This is not something that we can just paint pictures of and, and, and put on our walls for everyone to see. This is for those who trust him and humble themselves and turn from their sins. And so, finally, the last scene in the parable is the friends and neighbors all gathering around to celebrate and rejoice together. And I think we could say that that's a, an image of God himself and the angels. And we'll say the saints in glory, all rejoicing when a sinner repents. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. There will be joy in heaven is what Jesus says. So I think it's meant to express this idea that God himself is pleased when a sinner turns from his sins. But the angels are also joyful and glad. And I think the saints are also in on this joy. It's the whole community of heaven. Commentator Richard Lenski put it this way, All the mighty works of men cause no jubilation in heaven. But one miserable sinner's repentant state does. The greatest, most applauded, accomplished man in the world, all of his feats don't cause any joy in heaven. But a sinner who repents, that causes a party in glory. And if it causes a party in heaven, then we should learn to value it while we're here on the earth, shouldn't we? That's exactly where the scribes and Pharisees in verse 2 failed. They had no joy at the sight of sinners drawing near to Jesus. Heaven was shouting while the scribes were complaining. Self-righteous Pharisees didn't care if sinners were saved. That wasn't what their lives were about. They were more concerned with exalting themselves and using the poor and the weak and the needy around them. They were more about glorifying themselves and boasting of their own goodness and righteousness. And so unless they were healed from that blindness and that hardness, 
they would never know the joys of heaven. They would never be part of the celebrating that takes place in glory. And so I want to close this message. And it's only the first part as we work through chapter 15. Next, uh, next time we're together, we're going to look at the parable of the lost coin, which is directly connected to this parable of the lost sheep. We just don't have time to put them both together into one message. But for tonight, we're going to stop there, and I'm going to close with a quote from the scribes and Pharisees. I want to say with joy what they said with unbelief. This man receives sinners. Praise God. This man, the man Jesus Christ, receives, welcomes, eats with sinners. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the friend of sinners. Thank you for the good shepherd that goes and gets every lost sheep called by your name. Father, I pray that we would be about that work. I pray that we would be full of passion to reach the lost, that we would love the truth of your word, and that we would agree with the work of the shepherd, that we would be under shepherds and helpers in this great undertaking, Lord. And I pray that some would get saved, that we'd see sinners repent, sheep be found, and your church growing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.